Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 15th event of the Decolonizing Europe online series by the Amsterdam Center for European Studies. The convenors of this series are my colleagues Tasni Manoir and Beste Ischlegen. My name is Dimitris Buris and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. I would like to thank Tasnim and Beste for inviting me today as a guest co-host of this event entitled Decolonizing Hellas. The Greek nation state has long been described as the cradle of Western civilization and the birthplace of democracy. This year also Greece celebrated its bicentennial of the Greek revolution which coincided with temporary world revolts and renewed struggles against the colonial legacies of white supremacy, nationalisms, and racial capitalism. What is the relationship between the Greek nation state and Europe's colonial genealogies? How has Greece co-constituted this European colonial project? What does it mean to decolonize Hellas? These are just some of the questions we will explore in today's webinar. Our format is the following. We will kick off with a conversation with our guests, moderated through topics. This will be around half an hour and we will then move to the Q&A session. And we look forward to your questions, which you can send to us using the Q&A box. Upon this, we're very honored to be hosting today two distinguished speakers and funding members of the collective of the Decolonized Hellas Initiative, Nicolas Kosmatopoulos and Vespina Lalaki. Nicolas is an assistant professor in the Department of Politics at the American University in Beirut. He studies international policy institutions focusing on expert politics, epistemic violence, technomorals and the cosmopolitanisms of humanitarianism and peace and the cosmopolitics of solidarity and political equality. This year, as a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, he is completing a monograph on violence and expertise in peacemaking and crisis prevention in post-war Lebanon. Vespina Lalaki is an adjunct associate professor at City University of New York this year she is also Marilena Lascaridis, Visiting Research Fellow in Modern Greek Studies at the University of Amsterdam. She is a historical sociologist interested in the long-term social and cultural changes, changing modes of consciousness, the ideological and cultural foundations of the state, and the role of intellectuals. Currently, Vespina is working on a book project in which she investigates the ways American policies of economic liberalism and capitalist democracy invested symbolically in Hellenism, radically transforming it in the process. Nicola, Vespina, welcome and thank you for making the time to join us this afternoon. I'll kick off our discussion with, with asking the first question. As I mentioned in the introductory remarks, the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution coincides with contemporary world revolts and renewed struggles against the colonial legacies of white supremacy, nationalism, and racial capitalism. Is the founding of the collective Decolonized Hellas another coincidence in this sense? Yeah, you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and uh, certainly, as you suggested already, or as you implied, uh, this is not a this is uh, not a coincidence at all. Uh, first of all, the project, which uh, it's basically uh, Nicola's idea, uh, was very much inspired by the celebrations and various narratives that we saw emerging in the relation to the bicentennial of the Greek uh, Revolution, um, and uh, and very much uh, related also to a number of struggles that you already identified taking place around the world. So. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, which started as a, an American-based movement that has evolved into an international one, 
the struggles in, uh, for liberation in Palestine, uh, the struggles of South American people, indigenous people, uh, and, and so forth, uh, are basically uh, not just calling for a, uh, calling out British imperialism or the American racist legacy, but uh, it seems that they seek to dismantle the whole uh, Western edifice, the whole uh, Western uh, project of the civilizing uh, mission. And uh, we think that uh, Greece basically has taken, uh, uh, has had an uh, important role in that, something that has not uh, often been acknowledged. Uh, so we're trying here to precisely like unravel those genealogies and geographies of European uh, colonialism and the, the role or the ways that uh, Greece or more specifically Hellas, and we will explain, has uh, taken part in or has enabled that project. Um, just to say a couple of more things, um, the Greek nation state has uh, long been described, as you suggested, again, as the cradle of Western civilization, the birthplace of democracy, and we can discuss this a little bit further. Uh, and most importantly, one of the narratives that we followed, we, we uh, watched, uh, we're still actually unraveled. Uh, emerging, the mainstream narrative uh, was one that was trying to, to see this as essential as a European project. Uh, it has been lauded as the, this revolution as the first national European revolution. Uh, and this scheme ver sees very much Europe as a uh, Europe of rationality, rationality, of justice, of freedom, uh, as the project of enlightenment. Uh, and in the process, however, what is forgotten is, is uh, the Europe of uh, colonialism, Europe of uh, genocidal violence, something that uh, in the whole scheme of modernity is often seen as, uh, as parenthetical in its, uh, as in the history of Europe. Um, uh, histories of or stories of white supremacy, patriarchy, anti-Semitism, and today, of course, Islamophobia, that is making another uh, comeback in different forms. Uh, and all these basically have been neglected from these official uh, narratives, which we wish to explore further. And the last point here is that this Greek national independence basically marks not just a break with, with an empire, with the Ottoman Empire, uh, but also the beginning of a long process of appropriation of narratives and practices that they were already in place, uh, serving that European colonial project that, of that civilizing mission. So the establishment of the new state set in motion a number of acts of ethnic cleansing, creation and policing of minorities, denial of identities and violent homogenization, which um, in that process of that, in that celebration, we sort of take as that natural evolution of a nation state building. Uh, and we want to address that, we want to question that. Um, so I can, I can stop here um, and we can continue uh, focusing on specific things that I already mentioned. Um, may may I jump in? Okay, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Beste and Dimitris and Kertu for organizing this, and Tasnim, I guess. I, I guess you guys are the organizers, and it's a great team. It's also wonderful to to be in Amsterdam digitally from afar. Uh, also, because we talk about about the the you know the the connection with uh, with. Uh, capitalism and colonialism. It's also a very fascinating series that you're running over there. I was also really a fan before you invited me uh, there. So it's great to be on it. And it's a huge honor and a big challenge. So I hope that we're going to manage to connect all of the threads that you have already been opening up since uh, you started this amazing project. So for me, I won't add much to what uh, uh, Despina already said, maybe mostly some uh, two elements that were important uh, for, for thinking about this project. The first was a sense of discomfort, and the second was uh, a discovery. So the discomfort was about uh, the celebrations for the 200 years of the Greek uh, independence, which in Greece mainly were, of course, very uh, 
confined in Greece with uh, inviting some foreign leaders, but of course, Corona didn't allow many to come, but only the King of England, I think. I'm not even the King, the Prince of England actually attended. Everybody else turned their back. They used Corona as an excuse, who knows? Was it an excuse, was it a good reason? I don't know, but whatever happens, it was a very Greco-centric event and also a very Greco-centric narrative of what happened. So many of the bigger, uh, it, much of the bigger picture was left out. So the bigger picture was that the Greek revolution started a domino of revolutions in the Ottoman Empire that eventually led to a series of independences, a series of uh, wars of independence, and of course, a series of introductions of interventions by the colonial powers. Now in Greece, there's a lot, a lot of debate about this intervention by the colonial powers, but it's happening either in terms of geopolitics, purely geopolitics, that the Russians helped us, the English helped us, the, the British or the, the French helped us, but nobody really looks into what were the ideologies and the, 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 the conceptions of the revolutionaries vis-a-vis -vis, um, the new nation state? What were their conception about the nation that they wanted to build? And what was also the economic and political aspirations? This debate is very much connected to what also Despina said to the ideas of enlightenment and, uh, and European um, you know, progress that the, that the Greek Revolution was actually a continuation or a copy, if you wish, of the French and the American revolutions. So the genealogy of the Greek Revolution wants it tied to these other Western revolutions. At the same time, of course, the discomfort comes from the, from the silencing of other events that were happening at the same time of these revolutions or at the periphery. Uh, as the revolutions wanted, or at the center of the of the of the global stage, as many post-colonial scholars have been arguing. For example, the revolution in Haiti, which very much uh, was totally blanketed out from the celebrations, despite the fact that Haiti was the first country that recognized Greece for for a number of reasons uh, that were very interesting and very, of course, contextual back then. So the colonial world and the colonial uh, universe of providing ideas about race, about religion, about the other, about nation, about science, about progress, was totally eclipsed from this public discussion in Greece. That was a discomfort that we wanted to push back against. So we thought that, you know, there has to be some connections made with, you know, the colonial legacy of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, uprising also not only in terms of the ideas but also in terms of the, the economics behind it and this is where I come to the discovery so a discovery can be something quite um, symbolic if you wish so what did I discover I discovered that the, the Greek flag is mostly today's Greek flag as you know it right the the blue, white, with the cross and the, and the stripes, were very much actually a copy of the nautical flag of the East India Company, being now in, 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 in Amsterdam and in, in England, uh, you know, England across the channel, which was already uh, circulating 100 years before the revolution. And that was too much of a coincidence, right? I mean, you talk about the coincidence at the beginning, I think that was even a more interesting coincidence, if you ask me. As an anthropologist, I'm not a historian, and we should definitely, you know, excuse ourselves from these guys, uh, the experts of history. I found it fascinating that this flag was actually, you know, um, a flag that was very much connected with a very particular, you know, way of governing countries. You know, the colonial uh, uh, East India Company became a state with its own army, with its own actually territory, with its own legal uh, uh, arsenal, and I couldn't really think why a new uh, nation state wanted actually to copy this flag. Maybe it was not even a copy, maybe it was just happened to, but there was a very interesting maritime connection there that needed to be explored further. And the more I explored, the more I realized that this is another blank spot in the, in the Greek history. Uh, and, you know, the connection with the economics of the, of the empire, you know, and how Greece connects maybe to the, to the imperial project that was unfolding back then. All of that somewhat is missing from the public discussion in Greece and we wanted to bring it back. 
Uh, and of course, not only historically, but also contemporarily, because all of these uh, questions, they have their repercussions in today's topics. You know, the place of Greece in the Balkans, the place of Greece in the wider Eastern Mediterranean, the place of Greece in Europe, was very much challenged uh, 10 years ago after the crisis, during the crisis and all so on. So we realized that this is an entry point that allows for a series of other questions. Very, I think, hopefully fruitful uh, discussions are going to make. Thanks. So thank you, Despina and Nicolas. Uh, I am also happy that you have accepted our invitation to be on this panel today. And I think this event also invites us to think about uh, whether colonialism and imperialism are synonymous, uh, or we should treat them uh, in a more critical uh, way and not maybe uh, think them as being synonymous. Because I'm, I myself, are struggling with uh, these two concepts. Because in the case of Europe and its imperialism, I think colonialism and imperialism seem to be uh, meaning, the, meaning the same thing. Uh, but especially uh, in the geography that we are talking about, Greece and Ottoman Empire, I still have struggles uh, with these terms and whether these terms uh, could be used interchangeably. So I really value this event to talk about it. And uh, saying this, um, the next question will be about maybe uh, an opportunity for us uh, to unpack these two terms. Uh, what we see is that there are some examples of Greek imperialism and also ancient Greek um, projects of Asia Minor and Southern Italy, for example. Uh, also the wars of Alexander the Great could be considered by some people as imperial expeditions. Despite this, Greece is not considered to have been a colony or a colonial power. Uh, but it has been subject to imperialism, Ottoman imperialism. So yeah, our next question is why you appear to expose decolonial thought, considering all this, and furthermore, more why Hellas and not Greece? So Despina, Nicolas, whoever wants to take the turn. Maybe Nicolas can take a break. I can, uh, I can take this and they can take the next. Uh, yes, one of the first questions actually we received, or if you wish, uh, uh, criticisms was actually that, that we are sort of trying to use like uh, questions or methodologies like in a uh, historical space, Greece, that uh, has never been like, uh, does not have like a history of colonialism in the modern sense of the world. Uh, most often also Greece understood as a, as a victim of uh, European or Western great uh, powers uh, has been analyzed as a, has been studied in terms of colonial schemes, but from the other side has been, as uh, Herzfeld has suggested, uh, has been described as a crypto colony or most recently with economic crisis has been understood as a debt colony. Uh, but um, the, the role that uh, Greece or the legacy of Greece, and here we start, uh, we're moving in the direction of uh, the term uh, Hellas, as a co-constituting of the European colonial project has not been studied sufficiently or not in those terms at least. Um, and, and you see how this uh, differentiation distinction between the term Greece and the Hellas uh, already comes up. Uh, Greece refers mostly to the, uh, this uh, uh, bounded, uh, geographically bounded uh, territory. Uh, Hellas, on the other side, is more like an, an idea, an ideal. Uh, so, with, uh, and often has been also uh, described as uh, colonized. Uh, so. And it has been colonized by, by the West, basically. It's this interplay between European modernity and, uh, uh, and the classical antiquity. It's a Western construct for the most part. But on the other side, it has been very much used by uh, modern Greek state, modern Greek institutions uh, uh, to, to legitimize itself. It draws legitimacy from it. Uh, one can argue that, okay, Greece or uh, Greeks had no uh, bearing or no saying in terms of what uh, uses of its legacy the Europeans uh, made or the, or the West at large. But uh, what we're interested in here is also the fact that uh, modern Greece heavily draws its identity from that legacy of classical antiquity of what then we, we call as, uh, we call Hellas. 
Uh, Helash also has another connotation uh, and which alludes to a Christian religious uh, tradition uh, that underpins the supposedly secular Western tradition. And, um, and what we, we observe like diachronically Greece doing is sort of uh, uh, offering itself as sort of what understood as a buffer zone, a cultural frontier uh, and the bulwark between Christianity and Islam, East and West, capitalism and communism, civilization and barbarism. And of course, all these take different like uh, connotations throughout uh, time. Um, one can bring this discussion to, to what is, is happening today that again, Greece uh, try, tries to offer legitimacy precisely from that legacy and again, offer itself as a defender of Western civilization one way or another. Um, so our objective here is, uh, is precisely to expose these colonial genealogies that fuel uh, Orientalism, xenophobia, Balkanism, racism, homophobia, and you, you name it. And also move in the direction of sort of building or envisioning or, uh, or creating uh, a, a new kind of Hellenism that is more uh, hospitable to, uh, not in a traditional sense of the word, to, to the other, to the different. Move in the direction of uh, more inclusive uh, futures, basically. So I, I think, yeah, you mentioned also something about Alexander the Great and so forth. Uh, very briefly, uh, since yes, Greece had not been uh, a colonial power in the European modern sense of the world, but has definitely engaged in imperialist projects in antiquity, also in, uh, in modern times, but uh, not colonial per se. Uh, but it has very much to do with a question of memory that uh, maybe if we have time we can discuss a little bit or uh, what in uh, the discipline of what we call reception studies. Uh, do, which is pretty much remember or study or uh, uh, tell these stories through the lenses of the present. So, or the lenses, so these colonial lenses, what we say that uh, precisely understand uh, Alexander the Great's uh, expeditions or wars or imperialist projects as, again, civilizing missions, uh, pretty much like what the European colonialists did with other parts of the world. So, So I hope uh, thank you. Marcin, the question. Yes, thank you for your generous answer. Uh, Nicolas, uh, can I invite you to follow up on this? Well, that's a very good question, a very long and, uh, and difficult answer, I think, uh, would be uh, the perfect way to go, but I don't think we have the, the time. But I will try to, to formulate one, a brief answer. I think uh, the, the connection between colonialism and capitalism today uh, is mostly established through research, um, researchers who have been looking into the development of uh, contemporary capitalism have very much, have very much actually, you know, discovered and followed its roots back in the colonial era. And I'm talking about the era of uh, so-called the Western and European mostly colonization of the world, which started say, you know, around the 15th century and went on all the way until almost, you know, the mid 20th century. Um, and in that sense, another, another way to, an, another field, let's say that uh, one can uh, locate this connect, connection and the genealogy is again, the maritime field that I'm very much uh, interested in. And in the sea, you can easily see, pun intended, the connection between, you know, colonial uh, colonial structures and colonial practices and how they give the prepare the ground for the new capitalist uh, era to come. And it's also not really clear, you know, the, the boundaries between the one and the other period are not really clearly uh, um, uh, there. So there is mostly an overlapping. So therefore, of course, when we talk about colonialism, and decolonizing Hellas, we also talk about capitalism. We also talk about the nation state. We also talk about you know, the ways that contemporary uh, nation states uh, protect uh, a, a legacy, uh, the, the, the legacy of their own um, you know, uh, birth and their own um, uh, making through a 
through myriads of institutions, schools, universities, academy, of course, you know, uh, the national history is being taught in, in schools, and universities. In the, grace of, in the case of Greece, the church is very important, also institution that goes far beyond the nation state. Uh, it's a very important, a very interesting question, the role of the Greek church, for example, in Palestine. Uh, many, many issues to be discussed there, but I'm talking about, you know, the institutions. So these institutions today are protective and protectionist of the legacy of the nation state. And by decolonizing one, of course, also means de facto decapitalizing, at least, you know, making clear that there, there are some other voices that have been silenced, uh, some other subjectivities that have been, you know, uh, pushed out of the national uh, belonging. And we want to invite all of these um, subjectivities to, uh, to speak uh, out, to speak back, to speak against uh, a national uh, idea that very much it's exclusive and exclusive of its own history, but also of its own present. And now I won't, I'm not really sure that I, I subscribe to the new Hellenism that uh, Despina uh, uh, you know, uh, described. Uh, I don't really think that we should name something personally that uh, you know, should be done. Uh, as a new ideal. I mean, it doesn't have to be a new ideal that substitutes the old ideal. It's mostly, I think, a process that we set out uh, to, 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 to talk, to meet with others like you guys and others who are also doing similar um, things out there. And this is uh, the major challenge. I think it's a process that really matters, uh, at least for me. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, just a reminder, because I saw that more people have been joining us, uh, please feel free to start sending us your questions by using the Q&A box if you have any. Um, but all this takes me, I've been looking at the website and I've been following the initiative, your initiative from, from the beginning, and it seems that the focal points of your work appear to be the relation between nation, nationalism, national identity and race, uh, the Greek monumental landscape and its relation to Greek, European, Western modernity, and what you call cosmopolitics. Would you like to elaborate a little bit more and explain these choices? Nicola, you want to take this too? I'll take the next two. Oh, there are two plus two. I, I don't know. I, okay. Um, very, again, very briefly, I think I'm also stressing a bit about the time. So I'll be very brief. Okay. In the Greek case, I'm reading just now for, to give you a sense of how the, the nation uh, uh, has become very much, you know, the idea of the nation has become also very much um, filtered through colonial ideas of race. Uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the declaration for prize that was issued by Ypsilantis in 1821. And I'm saying all this, you know, knowing that I'm not a historian and that a historian might actually come and, you know, knock on my door and say, hey, you, you're actually, uh, you know, occupying uh, a foreign ground, but I'll, I'll do again an anthropological reading on all of this. Um, there is a very interesting actually quote by Ypsilantis when he calls on the Romni, on the Greek actually uh, subjects of the Ottoman Empire to rise up and revolt. And uh, he talks to them saying that those of you who won't do that, uh, those of you who won't rise up, those of you who won't join the rebellion are actually Asian, um, Asian somehow half humans. Uh, you know, that you are not really Europeans, you don't belong to the European you know, ideal, you're not one of us. So already from the beginning, from the, from the very beginning, I think you can see uh, that the, the, the consolidation of race, religion, and, and nation in the Greek case. Of course, not in the same way with many other of the uh, participants of the, of, the, of the uprising, but the intellectuals in the uprising were very much people who have been studying uh, European ideas of, uh, of otherness and of, uh, of race, and they have been importing it to, to the Greek nation state. So this as a kind of a very brief, um, uh, maybe idea that that can connect to you, give you a sense of how, from the beginning, from the very beginning, actually, uh, the the idea of who belongs to the Greek nation was uh, was uh, filtered through colonial ideas of race, uh, 
uh, and, uh, and, and racism. The second thing that uh, you mentioned is about cosmopolitics was a whole different idea. Cosmopolitics is, is, is a concept, as you all know, um, proposed by Isabel Ch uh, Schengers, uh, in as a, as a way to move beyond what one could call a humanocentric uh, universe, right? And then it was taken up by modern anthropologists, by, by Latour, Bruno Latour and others in discovering uh, beyond the human, you know, worlds beyond the human. Uh, in that sense, of course, there's a big discussion about what kind of science does that cosmopolitics uh, aspire to, especially because if we move beyond the human as the center of the universe and as the center of the production of the, of the scientific, let's say, truth, one can open up to new ideas about um, other kind of sciences, alternative sciences, or even, you know, different ways of belonging to this common world, as they say. So we, we aspire to this discussion about cosmopolitics also because we want to discuss issues about indigeneity in Greece, also about opening up to a non-human perspective, uh, also uh, in, in, in Greece, you know, again, the maritime world is a wonderful, I think, opportunity at least to discuss about fish, and it's uh, here I also, uh, I also mentioned a well-known uh, saying uh, as a response to the competition between Greece and Turkey for the oil in the GNC, where the answer is the GNC belongs to its fish. You know, and this is a, a, a quite cosmopolitical, actually, I think, uh, slogan that should be taken very seriously and very actually literally uh, and should be, you know, should be followed uh, through uh, seriously. So that gives you also perhaps hopefully an idea about how economic politics should apply here. But of course, there are so many other possibilities and opportunities. Maybe I can add a couple of things to, to that. Um, uh, yes, all these, all these terms and ideas are quite complex and they have a long history behind them. And, uh, uh, and cosmopolitanism is one of those uh, terms that hides a number of things behind it. I'm, I'm thinking of another one like multiculturalism, for instance. So it is this ideology of imagining the world as, as one, as uh, united, uh, yet funded on economic, political, moral uh, divisions and hierarchies, uh, many of them introduced uh, during colonial times. So the questions uh, concerning, as uh, Nicholas already alluded to, of uh, capital circulation, of uh, global governance and distributive uh, justice uh, are central to any discussions of cosmopolitanism. Uh, we associate cosmopolit cosmopolitanism with institutions of world governance, uh, United Nations, for instance, or uh, uh, World Bank, uh, IMF, and so forth, that basically are institutions that, again, impose post-colonial or institutions that perpetuate uh, colonial uh, studying, standing on different form, uh, and imposing a view of the world that is distinctly uh, Western and uh, clearly still carries the imprint of, uh, of colonialism. Uh, so this is another direction that uh, we, we aspire to take. And uh, historically, Greece has often found itself at the, at the center of these discussions, uh, talking about circulation of capital and the importance of uh, uh, shipping and maritime, uh, maritime trade. As uh, Nicholas already uh, mentioned, uh, Greece does have, uh, until today, a central uh, place. Talking about world governance or world governing institutions, one can think of this uh, of the 1922 uh, Asia Minor uh, disaster, where the, historically is the first time of this uh, exchange of population on the basis of this magnitude uh, on the basis of, of religion, and the whole set of rules and regulations were put into place. Uh, concerning uh, the question of how we're going to deal with the mass population movement and refugee movements in the future. So uh, uh, we found then that uh, Greece does have a place, uh, an important place, beyond any sense of exceptionalism or anything in, in those discussions. So cosmopolitans or cosmopolitics, more specifically, is, uh, is a direction that uh, we want to take this, uh, this effort to of problematizing uh, 
Well, thank you both. Uh, and actually what you have said, this Pina ties very well with the uh, next question. And which is about uh, what kind of intervention uh, your initiative, Decolonize uh, Hellas, uh, wants to make. So the past decade uh, or so, Greece has been at the center of international attention, the economic crisis followed by another so-called crisis, uh, meaning the influx of refugees uh, in the country, trying to cross to other European countries, and the most recent um, increasing deficit of democracy in the name of public health, security, and safety. So the question is, is your project, your initiative, a response to uh, all of the ball? Uh, it's a kind of intervention to all of these, uh, what's happening um, in the last uh, decade. Uh, without being an explicitly political project, uh, our intention is to, to take part in this uh, public uh, discussions and narrative. And most and often like to to draw connections that are from the outset not always clear. So talking about, for instance, the uh, yes, uh, all these so-called crises that you identified, the economic or the refugee crisis, and what we can call a crisis of democracy for sure at this moment. Um, one needs to to draw the connections or or make those connections more apparent. Um, and I think, or we think, that these events are very much inscribed in a much bigger picture and an overarching narrative that is closely associated with uh, what is often feared as the demise of Western civilization. Um, that uh, that civilization has again been largely understood uh, as capitalist, anti-leftist, anti-communist, and, and I will explain, and, and largely white. So we are currently in the midst of a civilizational thinking comeback. Civilization, I mean, uh, for people in the humanities or especially social sciences has been a term that for a while was thought as being obsolete or uh, not, uh, not very useful, uh, precisely because of all these colonial uh, references and connotations and uh, hierarchies. But it seems that it's making a comeback in the, in the popular discourse and narratives. And it seems that, um, that Greece, uh, finding itself in, in the midst of all those crises, uh, tries, uses, tries to, to assert its place in this civilized Western world as a protector of Christianity on the one side, of whiteness and democracy at a time that this place uh, has been widely contested, especially during the economic crisis of uh, 2010s and uh, following that. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, it offers itself as a, as a bulwark uh, against the influx of population which appear to threaten the Western identity in its roots. Uh, once again, then we see Greece trying to secure its place as a defender of that Western civilization. And these civilizational narratives uh, have been uh, popularized for some time now. Um, I can refer to writings of uh, conservative uh, or also liberal intellectuals uh, in the United States, in Europe, but, uh, and that uh, basically raise those concerns and uh, and recycle uh, the ideological constructs and historical fabrications about the moral cultural superiority of the West, uh, West civilization. Uh, and as I mentioned before, this, this feature as a deeply anti-Islamist, anti-leftist, most often disguised as anti-totalitarianist, uh, largely equating here fascism and communism, or as a, as a human rights defense, coupled with the language of emergency, crisis, and, and catastrophe. Um, we can name a, num a number of uh, discourses that are closely associated with that. The other day here in Greece, we were uh, debating uh, a conference that was called and uh, calling attention to the fact that uh, birth rates are really low in Greece. Uh, that conference was supposed to be presided by uh, priests and uh, heads of uh, private clinics that they handle uh, this, this kind of uh, questions of birth control and so forth, uh, or uh, artificial insemination. Uh, so there was a public uproar against that. 
Uh, so one, if you want to, to dig deeper and try to understand uh, the, these calls for uh, low birth rates in, in, uh, in this country, or we've seen similar discussions like in, in Europe, uh, as in getting older, like uh, continent and so forth, at the time that so many young, so many kids are trying to make it over from Middle East, from, from Africa. This is the same kind of concerns we see like in the United States and they have led to the, the rise of extreme right and extreme like uh, racism. So deep down the concern is that uh, countries, nation states that are perceived as, as white uh, are uh, threatened by the influx of brown, black people, uh, Muslims and so forth. So um there is a lot to think in in that uh, direction as well one can discuss more in detail the question of race uh, the place of, of monuments in all this uh, discussion uh, but uh yeah maybe i should maybe i should stop uh, should stop here thank you vespin and nicolas do you want to add something yeah. Were many topics on the on the table. I mean, what we we'll have some questions as well to address. Yeah, maybe 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 questions is uh, is better. I think you know we opened it up in many ways, so I think we can you know discuss a bit now. There's so and many things one can say. I think there is a very relevant question as well from the audience. Very relevant to what we've been discussing. Someone is asking: Is there any correlation between decolonizing Hellas? and Enosis or Megali there. Uh, if you can also, you know, explain what Enosis is, because I mean, we are Greeks and we know what it yeah. is, but maybe our audience doesn't. Okay, I can I can go if, you, if you're okay, there's now this. Um, Enosis is the solution that the Greek nationalists suggested to the Cyprus question. So Cyprus is uh, an island, right? In uh, an island nation. Uh, in uh, in the East Mediterranean, very close to Syria and Turkey, uh, which has been habitated by different uh, um, populations since long time now, and has been also colonized by the Brits. Actually, it was a British colony until very late, until 1958, if I'm not wrong. So in 1958, there was an anti-colonial <laughs> struggle that eventually liberated the island from the Brits, and the question remained then, where does the island belong? So the Greeks wanted to unite it with the motherland. Uh, therefore, Enosis stands for un union. And uh, while uh, the Turkish, also part of the island, the Turkish kind of minority in terms of, uh, of numbers, were mostly either uh, proposing a taxim, right? Uh, Besta can, can correct me here. Or, or at least there were many, of course, uh, among them who wanted an independent Cyprus this, uh, beyond, you know, Greece and Turkey. But uh, and the Negali there was uh, is the means the big idea, right? Uh, the big idea, which is uh, the idea that Greece has to rehabilitate, so to say, territories and populations, mostly territories that belong to Greece since times memorial many of these territories are now of course parts of other nation states like uh, asia minor in turkey like uh, uh, north uh, macedonia uh, like in albania and other parts uh, so the magali there is very important also because it has been there since the very beginning of the greek nation state Usually we connect the Megali there with the adventure, with the colonial adventure of 1918, where the Greek army moved into the Turkish uh, inland, hinterland, all the way almost to Afyon Karahishar, as Beste also knows, I think, best here, or maybe not. Uh, and then uh, the story goes that uh, that that time, much of the self-fashioning um, of the Greek attack was couched in in colonial terms so it was all about seeking uh zotikos horos seeking uh um you know how you say that a uh, vital space uh in many in many ways you know what was supposed to be to rehabilitate 
It was supposed to be actually the fashion of the day to rehabilitate uh, Greek-owned uh, territories uh, with the revivalism uh, that, of course, uh, was totally constructed and totally dangerous and eventually it ended up in this uh, huge uh, disaster uh, for both nations, Greek, Greeks and Turks. So, yes, the colonized Hellas is a very much uh, connected to these uh, ideas. Um, in Greece, one should uh, definitely discuss these ideas as colonial projects, uh, and this has to be discussed openly. Nationalism, in this sense, is also very much connected to a colonial uh, genealogy. It's not just about how different nations in, in Europe uh, came up with the idea of, uh, of a distinct cultural identity, but very much as different post-colonial thinkers have uh, discussed, and I'm sure also in the series of, of your series have been uh, able to prove, uh, nationalism was born uh, as a colonial uh, idea too. It was not really only a European idea, so a colonial idea in that sense. In Greece, it was also in many ways pro produced as a colonial idea itself for the Greek nation state, but at the same time, the Greek nation state and the birth of the Greek nation state, as well as Cyprus, gave, uh, gave uh, an impetus, produced a genealogy, if you wish, <clears throat> of conflict resolution in the, in the post-Ottoman Empire that included many catastrophes, many catastrophic ideas like the exchange of populations, like Vespina said. The exchange of populations was, was devised by the great powers to solve the problem between Greece and Turkey, and that was, of course, a humanitarian disaster, uh, an ongoing humanitarian disaster that they deemed so successful that they then proposed it to another place in the world, India and Pakistan, as you know. So Greece was the laboratory, I mean, that, that, this territory, if you wish, a, a laboratory of many colonial-made ideas of how to deal with the, the palimpsest of the, of the Ottoman Empire and how to deal with the coexistence of populations, religions, and, uh, and cultures. And uh, to a great extent, it's also, uh, it, it, Greece gave its, also in, its own answer to this question. So Enosis and Megali there were the Greek answers to the problems of coexistence in the, in the, in the, in the region with, with devastating, of course, consequences that are still ongoing. <coughs> Thank you, Nicola. Uh, Despina, do you have anything to add? Or shall we? I, have, I, I think Nicola did a very good job. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, so to the audience, you can send uh, your questions. We still have 10 minutes. Uh, so I would like to continue with uh, another question. So democracy features centrally at uh, the Western European project of modernity and nation uh, building, and Greece as, as its uh, cradle uh, occupies a special place uh, of strong, very strong uh, symbolic uh, importance and value. So do you think this is a case of ideological colonization? And uh, how does it impact social uh, and political life practices and identities? Should I take this? Okay, <laughs> Nicola seems exhausted. <laughs> too much time, too, too much time on the beat. <laughs> um, yes, I guess whether this is a case of ideological colonization. Um, uh, very briefly, uh, the short answer yes is, is yes. And the question then that follows uh, in order to understand what is uh, the place of all that uh, narrative in the modern uh, modern Greek uh, case or today, um, uh, to to sort of answer, I would I would like to uh, to, to give an example. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Athens Democracy Forum uh, that takes place. Uh, it is an annual sort of conference and the set of events that take place uh, in, uh, in Greece um, and is uh, first convened by the New York Times in uh, 2013. Today is run by a non-profit democracy, by a non-profit organization called Democracy and Culture Foundation. So I've been following them uh, a little bit um, and uh, it seems that in 2019 they invite among other people Steve Bannon uh, for those who don't know, Steve Bannon is the former advisor to President Donald Trump, 
um, and a well-known leader of the alternative right, which aspires, among other things, to build a European nationalist movement. Uh, the following year, one of the distinguished guests was uh, Juan Guaido, the leader of the US but uh, coup against uh, Venezuela uh, President Nicolas Maduro. Uh, among others uh, were Yuval Noah Harari, um, Microsoft President Brad Smith, Sync CEO and founder Kristen Davis. Uh, and then these people basically spoke at the panel that was called Technology and the Future of Democracy. There was also an interview uh, and discussion between Prime Minister Mitsotakis and uh, Harari. Uh, this was administered, moderated basically by, by the publisher of Katimerini, Alexis Papahilas. Uh, and to come closer to my point, uh, at the backdrop was, of course, uh, Parthenon, um, which Katmerini described basically as a very suitable for uh, deep reflection on the future of uh, democracy. So uh, all those events, uh, a series of, uh, of discussions and so forth, uh, highly publicized, taking place in, uh, in places such as the Acropolis Museum, the Atalostoa, among other places, I think they, they sort of give a picture of the ideological and political transformations of recent decades, uh, where basically you have international nonprofit organizations, companies, elected and uh, unelected highly paid officials offering their expertise and expert advice uh, on questions of public policy, global governance, uh, all posing as civil society civil society being the, the foundation of, of democracy, basically, and ready to face some of the greatest challenges of our times, uh, always in a very uh, technocratic approach and politically uh, free, um, I mean, ideologically free, neither right or left, as, as Macron at some point had uh, described it in one of his campaigns. So in the process, having the classical heritage uh, in, in the back in the background or as the, as the setting of those events uh, is the following that happens. On the one side, uh, that new uh, political establishment uh, with this new ideological bearings basically draws legitimacy from that. This new what Tariq Ali describes as the extreme center, this new mutation of liberalism draws legitimacy from this classical heritage. And on the other side, this myth of Hellenism is reinterpreted and acquires like new connotations and characteristics from which we draw uh, to define ourselves, uh, our national and political identities. Uh, I will give another example. Like uh, I think, for instance, the, the challenge or the, the, the hesitation or the resistance to, um, to leave uh, the Euro uh, in the midst of the uh, economic crisis uh, it was precisely because it wasn't just an economic issue uh, alone. It was deeply a question, ideological issue, and the question of identity. If we would leave the euro, uh, would, which entailed that we would leave Europe, it raises fundamental questions of, of, of identity that goes at the heart of what uh, Greece is or where Greece belongs. So this, these processes or this uh, symbolic uh, gestures and forms of representations um, hit really um, at the heart of, uh, of who we are or, or uh, the stories of, that we tell ourselves about who, who we are as political subject or as, uh, you know, uh, citizens of this world and this Western world, basically. Um, Thank you, Despina. Um, Nicola, do you want to also add something to that question? Just sorry to interrupt. If there are any more questions from the audience, please don't wait until the last minute because we have four minutes. So please, please write them in the Q and A box. One can add, I mean, to the question of democracy, it's so rich, actually. Uh, and maybe Nicolas can, uh, can add more to that since he's a specialist in the, the politics of the region. Um, 
the way that these narratives are enriched and extended to create new realities. Uh, in the last visit of uh, Netanyahu in Greece, who, if I remember well, he met with uh, Tsipras, uh, he, they were both, both leaders were featuring as uh, the defenders of uh, Western democracy in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East. Um, so here is like how this legacy of, of Hellenism and the classical antiquity or Hellenism and the, uh, um, Judaism on the other side uh, are extended to create new realities or to legitimize a new uh, relationships and uh, new kind of uh, politics. There's there's a very perhaps an interesting by 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 commentary that one can make now to all these central issues that that's been raised that again brings us back to the sea, uh, and there is a again a, an undiscovered and unexplored uh, connection there. I will bring to the discussion you know an amazing book by Timothy Mitchell. Uh, the carbon democracy, if you uh, if you're aware of it, in which the argument is very complex. But the point that I want to make about the argument is that the there's that it's a material materialist reading of democracy, which very much connects, you know, the circulation of the energy uh, that somehow fuels the planet and fuels our economies, with the questions of democracy, saying practically that during the coal era. Right, where the uh, workers could practically shut down the system because of the coal uh, networks that were in certain uh, vital uh, pipelines that could be shut down and then impose uh, demands. Talking about workers today is also a, a general strike in Greece. So we are some have somehow we are strike breakers, but uh, at least we do it hopefully for the good uh, cause too. Uh, and that changed totally this ability of workers actually to impose demands to the state, demands that very much open up, you know, social democracy, talking about, you know, social welfare, also representation, questions of rights, political rights, economic rights, and, and uh, representations, uh, and the questions of representation. This has diminished from the moment that the oil became the, the engine uh, oil of the global economy. And to that extent, I think the connection of Greek democracy is also interesting because the Greek ship owners carry most of the world's oil you know, around the world. So you see there that there's a very interesting, totally underdiscovered, again, unresearched question between you know, uh, shipping and democracy that has to be somewhat uh, addressed, perhaps in another occasion, because I think now we're running out of time, uh, in unexpected ways. Um, yeah, just uh, food for thought maybe. Well, thank you for this, um, and I would like to use um, also uh, yeah, the, my role as a chair to maybe ask a question. I mean, no country, no state is uh, monolithic. Maybe states have some form of policies, official policies, but societies are much more diverse. So I was wondering whether um, you can maybe give some examples uh, from history where uh, the Greek population, some part of the Greek population have also shown solidarity with uh, anti-colonial transnational movements, for example, uh, for example, also during the refugee crisis, we also observed that the Greek society is again not monolithic. Uh, there were also solidarity movements uh, and um, also resistance to um, the Greek external European Union external border being the colonial frontier. Um, do you have some maybe historical examples where you um, observed that there is some kind of anti-colonial uh, uh, struggle also or resistance within the Greek society? That's a big question, uh, best. <laughs> uh, I don't know, uh, this maybe you want to try uh, to answer. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite uh, crucial, but I don't know how one can answer that. One can think of uh, individual cases to uh, support to the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa by uh, Greek, uh, I forget his name now, like uh, the Greek lawyer, uh, help me, Nicola. <laughs> Bezos, Bezos. Thank you, not Bezos. Bezos, not Bezos of Amazon. Uh, um, the other Bezos from uh, South Africa. 
Right. Um, the support to the, the struggle in Palestine, in Greece, had been uh, quite strong in the, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, at the time that uh, that support was coming from the very top, the Greek government, actually, um, and followed by a great number of, uh, of people. Um, uh, exact post, I mean, anti-colonial movements, uh, there is in the, the participation of, I mean, very symbolic at the time of uh, Archbishop, Archbishop Jacobus in, uh, in the United States supporting the civil rights movement in the, in the United States. Something that, again, um, it has to be studied in greater depth uh, in terms of uh, what the support uh, amongst the, the diaspora was, because he also received uh, a great deal of criticism for doing that. Um, but amongst the people or like on the more uh, grassroots level, I think uh, th there has been a support uh, often uh, more in more abstract terms uh, in supporting like anti-colonial movements and so forth. Uh, maybe not in a concrete material uh, terms always. Uh, and this is another challenge here. Um, maybe also like uh, trying to define or de redefine that, that Hellenism or, or try to historically trace it as well. Because there is a, one can read here also uh, emancipatory uh, histories and possibilities that uh, exist. And from which we might be interested in drawing lessons or uh, trying to understand them more or more closely. I mean, if one wants to, now, I mean, there is a danger of also overextending the, the use of the term colonial, but uh, Greeks have certainly, and Greek diaspora has certainly taken place in uh, uh, workers' uprisings and the uh, violent, bloody uh, struggles in the United States uh, that I know better in other parts of the world. Uh, today even celebrated in a rather nationalistic terms, but still like recovered and, uh, and studied. Uh, so yeah, there are definitely, and one can come to, to closer like uh, politics of the early 2000 and most recent 2010 and 2015, where you had, uh, and this here you have like a direct dialogue amongst, let's say the Spaniards indignados and the, the Greek Aranakismeni, all those social movements and of course of uh, Arab Spring and Tahrir uh, Square, like where people were uh, in direct contact as well, in addition to ideologically close and sharing the same struggle. Um, so there are definitely, yes, history stories like that, that they have been to be acknowledged, documented and uh, looked at more closely. You know, the interesting thing, just a last comment, the interesting thing is that this discussion in Greece is non-existent. Uh, you know, Greece doesn't discuss colonialism uh, at all um, because apparently it has never been colonized or it has never colonized. And this is exactly what uh, colonizing, decolonizing Hellas wants to change, to discuss colonialism, uh, its effects in, uh, in, you know, in the nation, in the nationalism, in, in in how we understand the nation, the nation and also in resistances, as uh, Beste has, uh, has been uh, suggesting. Uh, in that sense, I think it's very interesting what uh, Despina uh, talked about, the connection with, uh, with Israel-Palestine, the contemporary case of settler colonialism by, for, for many, you know, what's going on there. And it's a very interesting discussion that just now, the last perhaps year, the Greek public discusses Palestine as a colonial project. It's also, even in that, uh, Greece has been somehow late, a latecomer. Uh, and in terms of the, uh, of the domestic resistance, this is a huge discussion, but I think there has been, of course, resistances to the Greek nationalizing project and the Greek ethnopolitical, if you wish, you know, homogenization by other populations, which are not necessarily not ascribing to the Greek nation or the Greek religious homogenization, you know. Uh, Macedonians in Greece, uh, Slavo Macedonians in Greece, Pomaks and others, you know, Muslims and other, but also uh, internationalist workers and so on that have been, you know, opposing to this uh, homogenizing project. But I think mainly the, the, the great majority of population has been very much supportive of the nationalist project, which, you know, it's, it's what happens also in many parts of Europe. I mean, in that sense, it has been a successful homogenizing project. 
Nicola Vespina, uh, we are running out of time or we have run of, out of time. I would like to say a big thank you for being with us uh, today and making the time. I know that you have a very busy schedule, so we really appreciate you being with us today. And also a personal thank you for bringing this kind of discussion in Greece. Uh, because as, as you mentioned, I think this is a discussion which, which has been missing. Uh, so I'm very grateful that you and the collective bring it in the domestic context of Greece. I would also like to thank uh, my colleagues Tasnim and Beste for inviting me to join uh, this event. Also our colleagues from the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, Kertu, Lisa and Heis for all their valuable help. Um, and for as far as the audience is concerned, please follow the Amsterdam Center of European Studies on social media. There are a lot of events which will be taking place after the summer break. Um, and yeah, just to, to close this off by wishing everyone to stay healthy and well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.